Coming up on today's Wild West. All aboard the Ghost Train, a historic Nevada railroad that'll let you take the wheel. It's an icon of the Old West, the stagecoach. Hanson Wheel and Wagon Shop is all about being authentic. You'll meet the South Dakota craftsmen who build them for the movies. Plus the town that took on Jesse James and won. You can even see the hitching post where the outlaws tied up their horses. Today's Wild West is just ahead. The Wild West, it's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. On a bright summer afternoon, the ghost train of Ely, Nevada rides again. More than a century after it was first built in 1909, engine number 93 rolls through the Nevada sagebrush. Powered by coal fire and steam, with engineer Dale Olson at the controls and fireman Angie Craycraft doing the heavy lifting. Fireman, fire whatever, I shovel coal. She's the train master. <laughs> She's my boss. <laughs> Olson, a retired United Airlines pilot, is among those breathing life into what a Smithsonian Museum official called the best preserved historic railroad in the country, bar none. A summer ride on the rails powered by a vintage steam engine is just the tiny tip of the iceberg of what the ghost train is all about. The Nevada Northern Railway, as it's officially known, is not just some kind of amusement park ride, but an entire century old railroad operation, complete with shops, tools, cars, tracks, and much more, run almost exclusively by volunteers. I can hardly imagine doing this 12 hours a day I mean, what the firemen did back in the day. While Angie is one of the few paid staffers, Olson is among the dozens of volunteers who do most everything it takes to make the trains go, from selling tickets to serving as conductor, brakeman, fireman, and yes, even engineer. We started out doing some brakeman work and then moving to firemen and then engineers. People are interested in our heritage, our history, can actually come out, volunteer here at the railroad, work their way up the progression, and yes, they can get up in the right-hand seat of the steam locomotive and be one of our steam engineers. Dale drives six hours just to be here, staying in a hotel on his own dime to come and run the train, but it's time well spent. I'm old enough to remember the last day steam on the major railroads, and I never dreamt that I would even get a ride in a steam engine, let alone be able to run one, <laughs> so, so it's good. The man who spent a career in the cockpit of America's most sophisticated jetliners can appreciate the antique technology of a locomotive that was the space shuttle of its day. That's one of the things is that this is 100 years old, and um, economically it is outmoded but it still gets the job done. It gets the cars up and down the hill, just not as efficiently as the new stuff does. It's enduring technology. It still works. It does, works very well. But keeping these engines rolling is a labor intensive job. Every hour you run it, you gotta work on an hour. <coughs> probably more than that, probably three to one. That's just because the stuff is so old? No, it's just the way it was built. They did that when they were new. They were doing new, <laughs> yeah. They had big crews working on this. Inside the cavernous engine house, welder Gary North is fixing a stress fracture in the boiler of this railroad's other operating steam engine. Old number 40 was built in Philadelphia back in 1910. But thanks to the daily efforts of a small crack crew of full-time mechanics, the engine runs like a well-maintained classic car. It's probably in better shape than when they were using it all the time. Really? Yeah. Got a lot of a lot better oils and lubes and bearing material. The engine house is like a time capsule from a bygone era. It's as if all the mechanics, welders, and the others who once kept the trains running here have just stepped out for lunch. And back in the day, this railroad was a very busy place. We're essentially a ghost of our past. During the day, 32 passenger trains, 60 yard trains, and a couple of freight trains each day left from right here. Hundreds of people worked here, thousands of people took the trains. This was the steam-powered internet of its day. Today, no more than a train a day leaves the station, 
but just firing up a single steam engine takes an awful lot of work. You gotta boil 1,200 gallons of water and develop uh, about 180 pounds of pressure. From a cold start, it takes some four hours to heat enough water to build enough steam pressure to power the wheels to bring this locomotive to life. In 1910, there was no such thing as sealed bearings, so oiling was and remains a constant job to keep the moving parts lubricated. Having oil around the bearing attracts dirt. Comes in so it scratches everything up and wears it out quick. While the technology is primitive, the guys who maintain these engines do admire the work of their mechanical ancestors. And it's real interesting when you tear into them and find out how they built them back in the day. And they're all real accurate. You can use your modern technology measurements and their measurements are right on. And while servicing and repairing train engines is a hard, heavy and dirty job, there's a tangible sense of satisfaction among those who do the work. It's kind of nice seeing stuff you work on running. Making people happy, riding a steam engine, anything mechanical, you like seeing it move. And few people anywhere like their jobs as much as John Henry McDonald. I got lucky. Uh, there's not too many places that run them, run steam locomotives, and there's even fewer that'll pay you to do it. 22-year-old John Henry first came here as a 16-year-old on a high school internship program. Six years later, he works here full time. And while quick to point out he's still learning, this young man can do most any job here. I work in the shop, I do track work, I'm in train service, I'm an engineer, I'm a fireman, brakeman, uh, and yeah, in the shop, I'm just a shop helper. Come on up. He's also quite the tour guide. If that's caboose three. But that's a switch list from the Nevada Northern when this car, when this caboose was still running for him. It's great fun to walk with him through the old buildings around the rail yard. The huge structures contain a fascinating variety of historic equipment and vintage rail cars. That's our 1907 100 ton steam crane, and it still runs. This was built in 1907 also. And what is this? It's a rotary snowplow. 81 was built by Baldwin in 1917. This was the last steam locomotive the Nevada Northern ordered new. It's in rough shape. They've taken a lot of parts off of it to keep the other two locomotives running. It's got a mail slot. Yeah. And so you could literally, if it was parked at the station, you could walk up and drop your letter through to the um, mail clerk. The Nevada Northern offers public tours of the aging property, donated in its entirety when the railroad shut down in 1983. It began when the first tracks were laid here in 1905 by Mark Requa to haul the ore from what would become the giant Kennecott copper mine outside Ely. Copper that would wire the nation, first for electricity and then for telephones. And as the sign says in the big engine shop, there's a lesson to be learned from the history of this place. I think the railroad tells the story of America that we're losing. And that story is a story of can do itness. We're not going out and doing things, building things, conquering things. That may be true elsewhere, but here in Ely, the can do spirit appears to be in good shape. I mean, that's the only way you can learn about something that's over 100 years old and they haven't made since the 50s. And this place, it tells a good story about what the United States used to be like. And it can be your story too. If you've ever wanted to be the engineer on an old time steam engine, you can make it happen here, either by working your way up as a volunteer or through the Nevada Northern's Engineer Experience Program, where if you meet certain conditions, you can essentially pay to run the train. It's not cheap, but then neither is the cost of running this most unique operating museum. People think our steam locomotives burn coal. They don't. They burn bricks of $20 bills. Your dollars are critical to keeping this living history alive and well and making sure that this marvel of the past rolls on into the future. I encourage you to become a member of either the Nevada Northern Railway Museum or the railroad museum that's near your home. The Nevada Northern has all kinds of special events throughout the year, including a Christmas season Polar Express photography workshops, and much more. Or you could just go for a ride. All kinds of ways to experience this most unique piece of living American history. Up next, we'll take you back to 1876 and the bank where Jesse James met his match. History happened here in the small town of Northfield, Minnesota. The only place in the world that can tell that they stopped uh, the James Younger gang. 
Hayes Scriven presides over one of the most unique Western museums in America, the bank where Jesse James and his gang met their match. It all ended here. It was September 7, 1876. Eight outlaws led by Jesse James rode into Northfield to rob the First National Bank. Frank James, Charlie Pitts, and Bob Younger walked in the door, uh, jumped over the, the teller's cage to force Alonzo Bunker, Frank Wilcox on the floor, they ordered them to put their hands in the air, uh, went over uh, to the cashier's table and asked uh, Joseph Lee Haywood to open the vault. Uh, he refused. Downtown Northfield, Minnesota looks much the way it did back in September of 1876 when the James Gang rode into town to rob that bank. You can even see the hitching post where the outlaws tied up their horses. Same floor, same nails, same everything. Jordan Fields is one of the guides that can take you into the restored bank that looks exactly like it did the day of the holdup. That clock there is the same clock that was there on the day. And the table too is the one that Haywood was leaning on when Frank James shot him. Acting bank teller Joseph Lee Haywood gets much of the credit for thwarting the bank robbery. He resisted the gang, costing them valuable time, but paid for it with his life. I'm proud that he did that. I think he saved Northfield that day. Displays in the restored bank museum tell Haywood's courageous but tragic story. You can even see his entries into the bank register before the holdup and learn the minute-by-minute -minute details of just what happened on that violent day. And the third and final group to get into position was made up of Jesse James, William Chadwell, and Jim Younger. Outlaw Clell Miller blocked the door to the bank, but he was spotted by J.S. Allen, who owned the hardware store next door, and sounded the alarm. Clell Miller decided to start a shoving match with J.S. Allen, and when it didn't go right, J.S. Allen was able to break free from Miller and yelling, get your guns, boys, they're robbing the bank. Henry Wheeler did just that. Today you can see the rifle he used to shoot and kill Miller and the pistol he carried for the rest of his life in case Miller's family came seeking revenge. You can also see some of the guns the outlaws carried that day. The saddle one of them rode and walk into the bank vault that held $15,000 that thanks to Haywood's bravery, the gang never got their hands on. They got away with just $26, but paid for it dearly. By the end of the robbery and the ensuing manhunt, three outlaws were dead and all the others wounded. The Younger brothers went to prison, and while Frank and Jesse James got away, the James Younger gang was history, and Jesse would be shot dead less than six years later. These townspeople rose up against basically an act of terror. And, and said, this is not going to happen in our community. That's impressive when that group had been doing that for 10 plus years. You know, no, who knows how many people they had killed. Northfield celebrates its brave ancestors every September during the defeat of Jesse James days. Horseback cowboys dressed just like the James Younger gang reenact the bloody bank robbery for huge crowds. And thousands tour the bank where that dramatic history happened and where the outlaws met their match. You know, Jesse and Frank and Cole and all them, they get the glory all the time, but it's never the townspeople that, that get the story, and here they do. You've read about it when you were in school and learned, and, and then you stand here where it all happened. It just makes life real, I guess. The Bank Museum is open seven days a week, and the defeat of Jesse James Days happens the first weekend after Labor Day every September. How would you like your very own stagecoach, chuck wagon, or some other authentic horse-drawn vehicle from the Old West? Coming up on today's Wild West, we'll take you to the very unique shop outside Mitchell, South Dakota, that can do just that. It's a romantic icon of the Old West, the stagecoach. In frontier days, it carried countless travelers through the wilderness. But the stagecoach is no relic of the past. At the Hanson Wheel and Wagon Shop outside Mitchell, South Dakota, the stage and all kinds of horse-drawn vehicles are being restored and recreated. Hanson Wheel and Wagon Shop is all about being authentic. Doug Hanson grew up on the ranch where his shop stands today and where his fascination with all things horse-drawn began. It started out as a, as a hobby, you know, growing up around horses. Doug's mom was a saddle maker, dad was a woodworker and a blacksmith. And when granddad taught Hanson to drive a team, he became intrigued with antique transportation. Pretty soon, you know, I was getting asked to make, uh, you know, restore the neighbor's buggy or, or repair a wheel for somebody. The hobby became a business back in 1978 that today employs a dozen craftsmen building brand new stagecoaches and wagons or restoring treasures from the past.
So this stagecoach took the first visitors into Yosemite Park. It, it uh, um, Teddy Roosevelt rode on it on this coach in the park. So this, this is a restored wagon. This, as you can see under here, there's the name of the original maker of the wagon, Newton. Um, behind the barrel, you can see some of the lettering there. <clears throat> this is a simple little runabout buggy. This was called a piano box buggy or a runabout. This is my own personal uh, stagecoach, and I've driven this on numerous trail rides. Uh, drove it across the, uh, the Triple U Ranch out where Dances with Wolves was filmed. Dances with Wolves is just one of a number of films Doug's worked on. Quentin Tarantino bought a Hanson stagecoach for his movie, The Hateful Eight, and Wells Fargo has bought some 20 stagecoaches over the years. Yeah, the most challenging uh, horse-drawn vehicle that we would work on is a stagecoach. It's the most complex. A stagecoach uses a suspension of leather and wood known as a thorough brace that acts like a big rocking chair as the vehicle rolled down the rough trails of the west, making life easier for everyone on the trip. The coach uh, rides on leather, and that takes the shock obviously off the body, but also takes the shock off the horses as we were talking about earlier. These ingenious vehicles are also quite beautiful. So when this is in the museum and people are, are viewing it, they're going to get to see, you know, the, the, the hickory wood that's used in the wheels, the yellow poplar that's used on the body panels, the cowhide that's used in the boots, and, and uh, when the seats are installed, you know, the, the nice uh, leather um, trimming in it. And then this will be ornamented in uh, 24 karat gold leaf with Yosemite National Park and you know Mariposa big trees and various lettering that would have been used uh, historically to um, give the visitors of the park kind of a you know build up some excitement to, to take the coach into the park. As impressive as it is, the Hanson Wheel and Wagon Shop does more than restore and recreate the horse-drawn vehicles of the 1800s. This place is really more like an archaeological dig where they're rediscovering the secrets of how these things were made. To me, it's very similar to archaeology because <clears throat> you, we get an old vehicle and it's covered in barn dust and it's covered in overpainting, so maybe it was painted five times with a broom. Um, and underneath that paint is, uh, in that dirt and grime, are bits and pieces of historical information. The learning never ends. Every part must be forged from steel, cut from leather, or crafted by wood and it all takes time. Start to finish, if you calculate all the time out, it takes just about a day and a half to make one wheel. Stagecoaches can cost $100,000, but there's no shortage of customers from all over the world wanting to own this icon of the American West, like the Japanese executives who came to buy a stagecoach for their theme park. And I had an old uh, Winchester leaning up in the corner that we used for prop shots. It was an old uh, 73 Winchester. Man, they picked that gun up and John Wayne, you know, and, and they're just, and these were, these were executives. These were, you know, wearing the, the fancy uh, suits, you know, and. Hanson also offers less expensive, but equally authentic pieces of the Old West in his retail shop. This is like a hardware store from the 1800s. There's decorative wheels, hitching gear for wagons, historically accurate cookware, and all kinds of other supplies. All the way down to the dinner triangle. But anyone wanting a stagecoach will have to be patient. Hanson has a year's worth of backlogged orders. A short drive away is the shop of another Western craftsman, rawhide braider, Whit Olson. But I, I just love rawhide as a material. It is, it is alive and breathing every single day. Rawhide braider, Whit Olson, hard at work in his South Dakota shop. Reigns and Romel, I really like a, a 12 strand um, body on the rain and a 16 strand on the Romel. The skilled hands of this craftsman produces enduring tools of the cowboy trade that are true works of art, like these braided rawhide reins, a bozelle, a quirt, or even a knife handle. I braided it almost complete to where there was just enough room and gaps in between that I could take another piece of rawhide, just one string, and I dyed that one using black walnut husks. Rawhide is tough. It all starts with the raw hides stretched and drying Absolutely. in Witt's shop. Yeah, this is actually a calf hide, came from a steer, probably four or 500 pounds. Trimmed it down, made a nice string out of it. Raw hide is not leather, not sold in stores, and you have to make your own. It's not something that can be bought. It's not something that can be made easily. Raw hide is just that, it's raw. 
Uh, there's no chemical alteration, no tanning done. Witt finds his own hides, strips them of hair and flesh, and stretches them to dry. You can't take a knife and stab through this. It is, it is rock hard once it's in its dry state. Dried rawhide is so strong, Indian warriors once used it for shields. But how does that hard hide become soft strands usable for braiding? To get from here to there, briefly isn't something that can easily be done. The stiff hide goes through a process called casing. And I'll put this right in water but I'm not gonna leave it in water. I don't want it to absorb too much moisture. I'm just gonna want it to absorb just enough. I'll take that hide and I'll put it in a plastic bag. It's gonna look like this. It's gonna be soft, it's gonna be pliable. From this, a person can cut string out of. It can take years to learn this craft. Witt got a big hand from two old pros, Nate Wald and Leland Hensley. Through a mentoring program, offered by the Traditional Cowboy Arts Association. What haven't they taught me? Uh, you, they, they will take everything that you think you know about rawhide and spin it right on its head and open your eyes to a whole new level that you didn't even know existed. It was the work of rawhide braider Vince Donnelly that started Wit on this journey when he was an 18-year-old cowboy riding bucking horses. He saw a set of rawhide reins Donnelly braided at a rodeo gear show and set out to make his own. These are called smooth reins. Smooth reins, is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Or horses. Fourteen years later, this married father of two has come a long way. His work is coveted by both working cowboys and collectors. But his lifelong quest to build quality rawhide gear has only just begun. Because I can always do it better. I don't know what it is about it, but it talks to me. When, when I pick up a piece of rawhide from the wall, it's telling me what it wants to be. And I just have to listen to it. And I love the finding out what it wants to be. Time to get back on board the train. Next stop, the Wild West town of Virginia City, Nevada. Stars in the air up at Opera House. Also on the left right here, we have the Silver Queen. Virginia City. Less than an hour outside Reno, this Wild West mining town of the 1800s is alive and kicking today. Step inside the Bucket of Blood Saloon, where the Comstock Cowboys provide the tunes, and where it's okay to two-step with your six guns on. have about 13 saloons still in town. At the peak of our boom, we had 110. So per capita, we're actually still probably on par. <laughs> the visitor center is in the old Crystal Bar, which boasts a crystal chandelier imported from France back in the 1870s. Virginia City, Nevada was one of the most important mining towns in the 1800s, and the place still looks pretty much like it did in 1876. There's lots to see and lots of characters to meet. I'm Monty James, and uh, I'm a professor of gunfighter. And I've been using this thing forever in the shows. <laughs> Take a ride with a happy hoofer and learn the history of Virginia City. <laughs> Hi, I'm Neil K. Cowboy. Some are better, some are worse. I'm just okay. Oh, I love coming we up here. We enjoy it. Yeah. Mark Twain rode for the local paper, but left town in a hurry to avoid a gunfight. Even the Catholic Church has a rich history. Built in 1868, burned in 1875, and rebuilt the next year, and today hosts both Sunday Mass and a historic museum. Just down the street is the 1870 train depot, where you can catch a ride on the Virginian Truckee Railroad. As we exit the town now, I'd like to welcome you to Gold Canyon. This is a good one. Tom Gray's 94-year-old dad, Robert, was a kid when he rode one of the last trains before the tracks were torn out in the 1930s. In the 1970s, he put them back in, resurrecting the line, and 40 years later, it's still going strong. The three o'clock just went down to Carson City. We used the number 18 locomotive built in 1914. And we have three Pullman built cars built in 1914 also. The train's a great way to see the area and the mining history of Virginia City's Comstock Lode that made this place a wealthy boom town for some 20 years. It was really quite impressive. The way they, you know, fell down and then came back up. You know how the town just fell apart. 
burned down, burned down and then and they we just built it back up and built it back up. Kept and going and with it. It's just what you do back then. This is one of the largest silver strikes in the world. And uh, some of these mines go down 3,260 feet, the deepest mines in the world. The stored train tracks go through some of the old tunnels built back in the 1800s. Now people board the train to both learn the history of the area and make their own. We just had a wonderful wedding. A bunch of great people got married just now and their, and their family was on it. And then we have a load of people going to Carson City right now. They got to enjoy Virginia City for the day. And, and these guys here, we have two more trips today and they're gonna get to see the highlight of Virginia City on the, on the train. And, and they come back and they get to spend some time on the boardwalk. At day's end, you can even experience the Old West while you sleep at the B Street B&B. It's Henry Piper's 1875 mansion, just down the street from the Opera House that still bears his name. My husband and I bought the house in 2004. It was a derelict rundown. Carolyn Eichen and her husband Chris saved the house from the wrecking ball. You'd never guess that today, though. Nearly three years of work has the home beautifully restored. Carolyn, a published historian with two degrees, is also an amazing cook. We took it on, and uh, we're very glad that we did that. We're glad that we saved a piece of history. People can experience what Virginia City was like during the boom. The only trouble with historic Virginia City is there's just too much to do. So I guess we'll just have to come back. That's it for now. I'm Mark Fedora. We'll be back next week with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. We'll see you then. For more information on the people and places featured in today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com. Thank you.